so welcome back. Uh, thanks for attending the session. Uh, my name is Josh Polanin. I'm the uh, managing editor of the Methods Group, and I'm also a, a postdoctoral fellow at the uh, Peabody Research Institute in uh, Vanderbilt. And you may have heard of them because of uh, one of my bosses, Mark Lipsy, or one of my other bosses, Sandra Joe Wilson, or one of my other colleagues sitting in the back there, Emily Tanner Smith. We have quite a crew. Um, so, and uh, right off the top here, I want to say I'm the one giving this presentation right now, and it's I think it it's going to be helpful to you all. But uh, this is by no means my thoughts whatsoever, solely. Uh, I had a lot of help. In fact, my mentor sitting right there, Terry Pickett, and Emily, and all the other people I mentioned, uh, were very helpful. So. Uh, this is on them, and then, of course, uh, the uh, wonderful people who, who write our code, which is what I'm going to talk about a little bit here at the end. Uh, those people uh, deserve an acknowledgement as well, so but we'll get into that. So anyway, thank you for attending. So <clears throat> we're going to talk about uh, multi-level meta-analysis. And um, I was talking to Julia Littell uh, this morning. I had breakfast with her, and, and uh, I was explaining sort of the overview of this topic. And, and she said, uh, well, multi-level meta-analysis, meta uh, the conceptual underpinnings of it have been around for quite some time. And, and she was absolutely right. Um, what I think that I can contribute or that the people who work on this can contribute um, is that in the last year or a couple years, the sort of uh, uh, software applications have come a really long way. and. It, I think in the meta-analysis community, we've started to embrace some of the complexity instead of shying away from the complexity um, as we have in the past. And so I think, um, although these concepts that you'll hear are, are probably, uh, if, if you've been around for some time, uh, will be natural to you and you, you will have heard them, but I think that uh, what I can help you with today is sort of expanding on what people have done very recently. Um, so <clears throat> uh, just as an overview, we're gonna talk a little bit about what are complex data structures? And I know Emily has talked about this already once, we've been there. Terry's talked about a very complex data structure as well. Um, so I'm gonna give you a brief overview on sort of what I think are complex data structures. I'm gonna review very brief, briefly, but uh, also generally, uh, what multi-level modeling is, conceptually. Uh, and then I'm gonna apply it to meta-analysis, which is what we're all here for. Um, and then the last, I don't know, a few minutes, uh, 20 minutes, I don't know what it'll be, um, I'm going to go over sort of uh, how you can do this stuff uh, in R uh, and in SAS, um, and we're going to talk about a few other things related to that. But uh, that part, maybe, it, maybe it'll be helpful to you all right now if you have R available or something you can maybe follow along. But what I really want it for, since we're filming this, is uh, for you to be able to come back to this uh, if you decide you want to use multi-level meta-analysis, come back to these slides, come back to this video, and you'll be able to sort of walk yourself through. Uh, but it's really a few lines of code, so it won't take you very long to walk through. <coughs> so, sound good? Good. Uh, I'll take your silence as a yes. So, uh, just, just a reminder uh, of the prior research steps. Of course, we have clear and explicit research questions, uh, and we, we describe explicitly what we're planning to do. Uh, we have inclusion and exclusion criteria that we walk through. We have a, su a systematic and comprehensive literature search. We document everything. We're very transparent about it. And then we have appropriate data uh, extraction in the form of study characteristic coding and everything that goes along with that. If you're anything like me, all of those steps are great. And I know that Ariel uh, and I were talking and, and, uh, earlier and we were saying, well, a lot of that stuff is done without us seeing it, right? So we're interested in more of the, the fun aspects, which is what I'm going to talk about a little bit today, and that's the statistical uh, underpinnings uh, through all of this. But, but what happens in the statistical world, right, or when we, when we try to explain this uh, to people who have done all of the study coding and had the brilliant ideas to start up the systematic review is, uh, we teach them and we tell them that the world of meta-analysis is quite clean, and it's quite clear and that if you go out and you collect 15, 20, 100 studies, each one of those studies is going to have one effect size and we're gonna calculate it and then we're gonna synthesize it. It's a, quite a simple process when you teach it that way and in fact, in a lot of our courses, that's how we teach it. And it looks a lot like this beautiful low resolution picture uh, of a, clean, and my idea of a clean office. But what ends up happening? Uh, it, you look like this in the piles of paperwork 
or maybe you're climbing up your paperwork like this lady is, and eventually you just have a huge pile of paper and you don't know what to do with it. Um, so the reality of meta-analysis is, is that it's often messy, right? Uh, we don't have uh, a clear <laughs> Uh, idea of what effect size we should be collecting because we often have multiple related outcomes, we often have multiple time points, we have multiple uh, control groups or treatment groups, we have subgroups, sub participants, we can go on and on and on. Uh, a pretty good example of this is I know something you can't see, but that's kind of the point. This is a table uh, straight uh, from a meta analysis that we're working on on teen dating violence. Um, and if I had a clicker, I would say, as you can see, uh, there's four columns up there. There's one for post-test, there's one for follow-up, there's one for an unadjusted estimate, there's one for an adjusted estimate, there's a knowledge outcome, there's an acceptance of female on male aggression outcome, there's a help-seeking behavior outcome. There's literally, you could probably calculate hundreds of effect sizes from this thing, is the point. And if you think about uh, what we usually tell uh, meta-analysts, we try to simplify that in some way. Right? We take that complexity and we try to, for lack of a better word, dumb it down some. Right? So maybe we are explicit in our inclusion criteria. And we say we're going to limit the types of effect sizes to only post-test post effect sizes, or only a certain group of, of, uh, uh, of people, of participants. Or maybe we set up some a priori decision tree where we extract only one type of effect size. Right? Or uh, we just had a meeting uh, this weekend where someone suggested sometimes you average effect sizes within, uh, within a study. Or you could do something, which is what I looked at in my dissertation a little bit, split up the analyses so you extract all the outcomes, extract all the data, but then you end up splitting up your analyses in some, in some way. Which can be helpful, but what ends up happening is that uh, there becomes a lot of splitting of your data, and it becomes very difficult to tell policymakers or to tell practitioners exactly what the conclusion should be from your meta-analysis, right? So I looked at, uh, in, my, in, in part of my dissertation, I sampled meta-analyses from education and psychology. I sampled 130 of them, and I had a coding document, and, and I extracted, uh, the basis of this was uh, how many statistical tests uh, meta-analysts use, but I did a lot of other coding as well. And uh, of the 130, I know that's not many, um, but it's fairly representative from education and psychology, 105 of those uh, 130 meta-analyses that I coded split up the effect sizes in some way. Okay, so if you look at those splits, 52% of the time, 68 of the 130, those splits were strictly by outcome. And now, I'm not talking about these really, really broad meta-analyses. Uh, which sometimes we have, and certainly we're involved with them at Vanderbilt. We're talking about specific, well-defined meta-analyses where the interventions are targeting often highly correlated outcomes. Uh, and, but what ends up happening is we don't have a way, or we, one way that we can uh, uh, conduct a meta-analysis is to split everything up by a very certain type of outcome. And that's what happens a lot of the time. 52% of the time, it's by the outcome. 25% of the time, it's by a subscale. So I'm not even talking about correlated outcomes. I'm, just ta I'm talking about a specific subscale within one scale. 25% of the time. These things are, these scales, if, if you've done some work like I have in, in factor analysis, are often very related. In fact, they're created so they're, they're measuring the exact same construct. And yet, 25% of the time, people are splitting these things up like they're completely different. And then, of course, you get sort of lower percentages as you go down the line, but some, a, a part of the time we just split things because maybe there's a male-only group or maybe there's a female-only group, and we don't know how to handle those. So this is sort of the, the, the overview of that. We'll, we'll probably be working on a paper, something like this, but this is sort of the, all of the different uh, types of, uh, of reasons that, that people split up these, uh, these meta-analyses. So what's, what's the problem with these ad hoc, ad hoc solutions? So, uh, I've sort of beat around the bush now as to why I think there's some problems, but um, it's difficult to state, even if you go into it saying I'm going to split up everything or I'm going to conduct different types of meta-analyses, it's difficult to state a priori what the outcomes are going to be. We uh, often don't know 
uh, exactly what is going to be measured. We don't know exactly the type of participants. We don't know exactly the types of designs. That's why we're doing the review. We want to review the, the literature base, right? So it's difficult to state this stuff, even if you wanted to, a priori explicitly. And then, of course, uh, what's the problem with averaging? Well, what is the average, right? We, do, we don't know what the, what the average of two subscales is. That's why the authors split them up. So why are we going in and averaging the result, the, the statistical test? Of course, then this also, if we select only one effect size per study, this limits the amount of data that we can actually use. Authors, primary authors, have decided that they think it's important for you all to read all of these different types of uh, statistical data and all this type of effect size data. Why would we assume that we know more than the primary authors? They presented all of the information. Shouldn't we be using all that information? Dimitri did a, had a nice talk yesterday on, on network meta-analysis, and I think this falls exactly in line with that. And he was talking about we should be using all of these cross-treatment comparisons, not throwing that away. We've got it right there. It's so hard to get these studies anyway. We should be embracing that. Of course, one other, thing, one other problem with these ad hoc solutions is the egregious amount of type 1 errors that we have in these things. It's incredible to me that, it's still incredible to me that we haven't addressed type 1 error problems. In fact, there's a really great quote uh, that I've used in my dissertation and some other things uh, by, I think it was Frank Schmidt. Am I, do you remember this, Terry? Uh, where he said, I think that meta-analysis is going to decrease the amount of reliance on statistical significance testing. And uh, all of you who have done meta-analyses know that is almost exactly the opposite of what's happened. And when you split up your effect sizes into certain groups, what do you end up doing? You end up running multiple types of uh, statistical significance tests. And then finally, of course, it's difficult to interpret what these things mean. <clears throat> okay, so that's my compelling argument for, for getting rid of uh, the past ways that we've done things. Any questions so far? I see a lot of people smiling because I think We've all, had, we've all had to deal with these issues, and I think there's probably enough of us here in the room who are methodologists and statisticians and realize I'm preaching to the choir right now. But for those of you who haven't heard this before, hopefully this, this, this sparks something. So <clears throat> I, I, uh, before I go any further, I need to say this. I'm not the only game in town, or what I'm presenting right now is not the only game in town. Multi-level meta-analysis is a really great uh, um, step forward and how we think about meta-analysis, but it's not the only game in town, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this right at the top. Um, there are uh, multivariate, which is technically, you could say, okay, multi-level models, meta-analysis is technically multivariate, but when I say multivariate meta-analysis, I mean that you have the structure of the covariance matrix in hand. So uh, um, I failed to put up Ingram, Ingrid Olkin's work uh, where you know the correlation or the covariance between the two outcomes. Uh, but when I say multivariate meta-analysis, I, I mean that. And of course, the problem with that, um, it's something probably Emily has touched on many times, and if you heard her talk, it's we very rarely know that correlational structure. We very, we very rarely know uh, or, or do primary authors report the correlation between the outcomes. Uh, so there's a problem with multivariate meta-analysis, right? And then, of course, uh, uh, something I'll talk about at the end here, but uh, you can also use robust variance estimation and it handles uh, the um, complexity of the data structure in a similar way, um, but there's still a few unknown properties, just like multi-level meta-analysis has, although these are being worked out as we speak and actually uh, one of them, this small sample size thing, is becoming less and less of a problem. So there are other ways besides, besides doing this. But then, of course, uh, what we're here to talk about, multi-level meta-analysis, and one way to handle the complexity. <coughs> so, um, what is multi-level modeling? I think this is probably going to be an overview for a lot of you, uh, but multi-level modeling occurs when there's a nest nested data structure. Um, so, the typical way we think about this in education is you have students nested within schools. And, oh, my arrows are, are a little bit... Um, hard to see up here, but if you look down below, we've got multiple schools there, um, and each of the happy little faces uh, are, have arrows pointing to the school, and each of those happy little faces, because they're in, the, in school one, two, three, and four, are correlated with each other, okay? And if we uh, 
if we forget about the structure, if we forget about the nesting structure, we underestimate our standard errors and we completely forget that all these kids are correlated with each other and we can make some pretty egregious mistakes, right? Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's the uh, sort of primary research thinking uh, of multi-level analysis. Um, but there's also an application to meta-analysis that Roddenbush and Breich, along with many others, have been talking about for a while. Um, and uh, if you go and look in their classic textbook, uh, this one's from 2002, they'll say instead of, uh, in meta-analysis, subjects, instead of uh, being uh, nested within schools, are instead nested within studies. So again, we have a, a, a complex data structure where the uh, subjects are, are nested within the studies. And then they go on to say that studies vary because of some within study variation and some between study variation, which is what we're gonna talk about next. Um, but it's a very close connection. In fact, it's, it's uh, statistically speaking, it's uh, almost identical between primary research, multi-level meta uh, multi analysis and uh, multi-level meta-analysis, if that makes sense to, to everybody. Okay. Um, Right, so uh, the <coughs> we should note here that uh, for all of you who have conducted a random effects meta-analysis, uh, you're actually conducting a two-level meta-analysis without being explicit about it. Well, maybe some of you are, but we often don't think in those terms. So you can actually think of a fixed effect uh, meta-analysis as a single level in their terms, uh, meta-analysis. When we conduct a fixed effect meta-analysis, what we're saying is that the tau squared, the between study variance is zero. Um, and when we drop that term out, Ron Bush and Breck would say that we actually have a single level meta-analysis. So when you've done a random effects meta-analysis before, you've actually conducted a multi-level meta-analysis, as it were. So the application to meta-analysis then, if you think in those terms, is actually pretty straightforward. Um, and this is a formula we've all seen before. Uh, you're in the advanced session, so this is, this is boring news to you, but I'll go over it just in case. Uh, we can say, we can have this complex formula and we can say that uh, the observed effect from study I, the observed effect size from study I is a function of, I'm writing this all out for, just in case people who watch the video, maybe they don't understand formulas. Uh, it's, uh, the observed effect is a function of, that's that equal sign, some overall grand mean of effect sizes, uh, as well as a random effect that's common to all of the effect sizes, and then the specific fixed effect, which is specific to that effect size from study I. Okay? And um, if we look, so this, this, if you can understand random effects meta-analysis, like I'm sure many of you have, um, the great thing about a random effects meta-analysis is that it's a pretty simple step to a, multi, a, a more than two-level uh, multi-level meta-analysis, okay? So why spend so much time on two-level uh, meta-analysis? And that's because three-level and beyond is just an extension of the two-level random effects meta-analysis model we all know and love and use quite a bit. So uh, in effect, what we're doing, this is the somewhat complex formula here, and I promised, uh, uh, well, Emily and I, I think, promised to each other, maybe, I don't know, uh, that we would be very formula uh, light. I'm guessing Terry, Terry was formula light as well, so we've tried to abide by that. I think this, I only have two more slides with formulas on it, um, and this is easily the most complex looking one that I'm going to present today. Um, and so, I don't have a pointer, but um, you can see, if you remember from the two-level random effects model, all we've done in this three-level meta-analysis is decomposed that random effect. And now we have a random effect that's still uh, um, across the board, the between study random effects component, that's the U3 or the mu3. But now we have one that's uh, within the study as well. Um, and this is going to represent across our outcomes. Uh, the random effects across the outcome within a study, and then across, uh, it's the average of that across all of the studies. So that's the, that's the mu2i, 
Okay, so we've just decomposed the random effects into two parts, the one that's across all of the studies and the one that's within a study across the outcomes. Okay, and so um, each of those mu, the two and the three, has a distribution, um, and that distribution is represented by our taus. So if you're familiar with the common uh, distribution of a, of a normal two-level random effect, uh, the application applies here. We now just have two taus instead of one, okay? And that'll be important because in a minute we're going to talk about uh, how much heterogeneity is represented and then also some R-squared formulas as well. So this is the, this is the nuts and bolts of three-level meta-analysis. It's actually not that complex. Uh, I'll pause for a second in case anybody wants some clarification. Otherwise, I'm going to show you this visually as well. Yeah. And so it's actually this. So that's, that, that leads me nice. So the, a nice concrete example, which, again, I apologize that it's uh, difficult to see here, but um, you've got the, the third level. Now, I haven't talked about specifically about the levels, but this is how I'll label them. The, when I say L3 or level 3, that's the study level. Okay. Uh, the second level, then, are the... Uh, effect sizes themselves, and there's multiple effect sizes per study. And I know that's hard to see, but it's, we have reading and math, which don't ask Terry if that's legitimate, because I know she has a different, but we're going to assume that reading and math are correlated enough that we can put them in one model. Um, but there's both reading and math from one study, and we're going to use both of those effect sizes uh, within that study. And then, of course, level one are our happy little people, uh, our fixed effect variance components, which we don't for you about too much because we assume. Cool. So this is one way to represent it. Um, another way to represent it, which I don't know how this is going to go over, but it's called, it's called a tree map. And I just think it's a really cool visualization of uh, a complex data structure. This is an R uh, uh, graphic. And has anybody heard of tree maps before? My economist? No? OK. Well, they use this in ecology, actually. Uh, but a tree map. Uh, is another way to represent hierarchical data, okay? And so the, um, this, is, uh, this is, I think this is made up data, but this is interventions to increase academic achievement, and these are my reading and math outcomes. Um, each one of the uh, solid black lines represented by the big numbers is a study, and then each one of the little boxes in there you could think of as an outcome, okay? So study 411, uh, all the way on the left-hand uh, side there, has 2, 5, 8, 11 uh, effect sizes represented within it, okay? And the cool thing about a tree map, now I'm giving a plug to the tree map people, is that down at the bottom there, there's the effect size um, uh, uh, representation by uh, color by the size of the effect size. So. Uh, all the way on the right-hand side, which you may not be able to see, it says 1.0, and it's, those are the very dark red boxes. Uh, so over there in uh, 1848, so study 1848, whatever that number means, uh, in the top right-hand corner you can see a really dark red box. That would be saying that that effect size specifically is almost close to 1. And then the ones with the dark black or the white are lower in size. So another way to visualize... I like to give, I, I think visually sometimes, so maybe this will help you think about what a multi-level structure looks like. Make sense? Yeah. And Emily's laughing at me because I really like this. <laughs> okay, so everybody's on the same page with what a multi-level, three-level meta-analysis is, right? Okay. So a little bit on the nitty-gritty needs to be talked about very briefly, and this is one of the last slides uh, with a formula in it, but we have to talk briefly and, and about the weights, the fixed effect weights, and um, this actually doesn't even come from the multi-level literature. This comes from the robust variance estimation literature, um, and the idea is that um, if you have some studies, if you have a disproportionate uh, distribution of effect sizes across studies. So some studies give you five effect sizes and, all, and some studies only give you one or two. Um, if you don't adjust the weights in this way that I'm about to show you, uh, you'll overestimate and you'll give more weight to those studies that have more effect sizes. 
for a study. And I can show this to you actually pretty easily. This sounds like a fairly complicated uh, idea. And in fact, when I was first thinking about multi-level meta-analysis, this really sort of tripped me up. And my boss, Mark Lipsy, sort of looked at me like, why can't you figure this out? Come on, you got to figure this out. So I set up a little thought example for myself. And I'm going to show it to you using Excel. Imagine that we have uh, eight effect sizes represented in three uh, studies. OK, that's all the way on the, on the far left-hand side. Um, I hate to break away from my nice little speech here, but Emily, do you have your pointer by any chance that I could borrow? Uh, so if we look at uh, the far left-hand column, that's my study ID. This should look pretty similar to everybody who's done meta-analysis, OK? Uh, the second column, column B, is my effect size ID. And we can see that study one has two effect sizes, represented as one and two. Thanks, Terry. Oh, I'll just I'll just use the pointer for right now. Um, <clears throat> so this uh, we have a, a study ID column and effect size ID column, and we can see that study one here has two effect sizes. Um, and the effect size is 0.2, and the treatment sample size is 50, and the control sample size is also 50. Okay? We go down, study two. It actually has five outcomes represented in it, and all of those effect sizes, in some miracle you've never seen before, have an effect size of 0.2, and lo and behold, also uh, sample sizes of 50 and 50. And then the final one, study three, has only one effect size, it also has an effect size of 0.2 and sample sizes of 50 and 50. Okay, now why do, I, why do I show this really simple example? That's because if we look on the next side, um, when we calculate the variance using uh, you know, uh, typical edges G or the Cohen's D variance, it doesn't matter what we use, the variance components, the fixed effect variance components are all gonna be exactly the same, right? 0.0402, okay? If we invert that, 1 over 0.0402, we get a, a weight of 24.88, okay? That's what that representation is. And so if we sort of sum that up and convert that into a percentage, uh, each one of those effect sizes represents 12.5% of the weights of the average effect. Is this making sense so far? OK? But if we calculate that up, then, the total weight from study one, two, and three are disproportionate in ways that they probably shouldn't, shouldn't be. So study one has two effect sizes represented in it, and it represents 25% of the weight. But study two, just because it has more effect sizes, uh, represents 62.5% of the weight. Right? And study three, only because it has just one effect size, uh, its weight is only 12.5%. So to deal with that, so to deal with the disproportionality of the effect sizes per study, we use that fancy little, um, fancy little calculation, and we adjust the variance within each study based on how many effect sizes are actually within that study. Okay. And so we create a column that says how many, the number of effect sizes per study. And then we calculate a new weight. And we can calculate a new percentage that those, those effect sizes represent. And when we do the math here, we can see now that we get a much more represent, representative uh, distribution of the percentages of the weight. OK? Does everybody see why that's a problem and how, how Larry has told us how to fix it? Does that make sense? Good, yeah. Uh, the idea is still the same, at least in, in this principle. We don't want to give, this, just because studies have more representation of outcomes, we don't want to give those studies disproportionate amount of weight. Um, and then finally, we should talk very briefly. This is something I'm in a completely black box on you. Uh, but we use <laughs> maximum likelihood and restricted maximum likelihood estimates, just like we do in, in primary research, uh, to estimate the tau squares. So this is the estimation process. You know, it's, it's a likelihood function, at least in the way that I've set it up. Um, and we use an iterative process to estimate those tau squares. Now, what that means is, uh, is something that I'm going to talk about on the next slide, that we do need sufficient data. And um, there are a number of sort of wonky principles uh, 
embedded within doing these things, like what happens when uh, you have you know, a majority or a percentage of your studies that only have one effect size per study, uh, or maybe you only have five studies total. Um, there are a few of those things that are left un unexplored. But the black box of this is that we use an iterative process maximum likelihood to estimate um, these models. So finally, I, I mentioned uh, Martina asked me a question about, uh, you know, why do we care about uh, the two levels of tau squares? Well, one of the really great things uh, about estimating these types of models uh, using a multi-level framework is that we can actually calculate uh, uh, two I squareds, one for each level, and then if we use Mike Chung's uh, formulas, we can actually calculate two different R squareds uh, when we start uh, conducting meta-regression models. Um, so when you actually throw these things into R or into SAS, uh, you will actually be able to calculate how much heterogeneity is associated with uh, the between study, uh, for between study reasons, and then also within study. Okay, and you, so you can see why these properties, especially when you start thinking about R squared, if you're going to use meta-regression, uh, why having these two types of, of tau squareds can be really helpful to you when you're modeling. Okay? I won't even go over the formulas, but the formulas are, if you've thought about I squared or R squared at all, these are very, very similar formulas. You're just using the different taus based on the different levels. Okay? Um, <clears throat> so, the last theoretical words I'm going to say on this before I get into just showing you what R can do and then comparing a few of the packages uh, is there's a couple questions you might want to ask me at the end, which are very legitimate questions that I just simply don't have the answers for yet. Somebody will come up with them, and maybe I will help to come up with them in the next few years, but I can't answer. Uh, so I can't, I can't answer what's the minimum number of effect sizes per study yet. Uh, we're we're going to say, we're going to assume these are large meta-analyses. Okay, for the time being. So uh, I'm going to steal what Emily told me yesterday. We're going to say 40 studies. <laughs> We're going to call that a large meta-analysis, or at least large enough to, to, uh, to use these things. Um, can some studies contribute all, only one effect size per study? Yes, they can. Um, but uh, if you have a, a high percentage of those, um, that's going to make it's going to be more difficult for your model to estimate the tau squared. So confidence interval around the tau squared is going to be much higher, and you might want to uh, think about maybe aggregating, especially if you have maybe, if you have 20 studies and 19 of them only have one effect size per study, that'd be probably a, a, an opportunity where I would just go ahead and average or take one effect size from that 20th study. I wouldn't try to estimate a multi-level meta-analysis model if 90% of my studies only are contributing one effect size per study. Um, how many studies do we need? Uh, I, I would usually say two, uh, like my advisor would say. You probably need more than that for multi-level meta-analysis. So, um, and so what? And then what's the bias, of course, associated with all this stuff? Uh, it's probably pretty high if you have a very sparse amount of data. Uh, yeah. So. Um, there's also going to be a question of, should I use robust variance estimation or multi-level meta-analysis? Uh, I haven't come down on that yet. Uh, this, is, this is like my getting everything out of the way slide all in one place. Um, I can tell you that I've used both of them and I like both of them. And probably as we develop as a community, uh, hopefully we can answer those questions a little bit more thoroughly. Okay, so for the last uh, 20 minutes or so, 15 minutes or so, I'm gonna walk through very briefly um, how to do this stuff in R using a couple different packages. I'll show you the code from SAS, and I'm, I won't do anything much more with it. Um, I was going to show you how to do this in Stata, and I'm working on uh, manipulating an already existing package, but I need to do a little bit more work on that, so that'll be in the works, and probably by next year I'll for sure have that. Um, I will tell you, we don't have macros to do this in SPSS um, yet, um, and there may be some other available languages uh, that this, this might be in the works on, but I'm not sure what they are. So I, I, I mainly use R in SAS when I'm doing these things. So my applied example is, uh, I think, so this is the one you use in the paper, right? Um, so this is a, a kind of a real and kind of a fake data set. Um, we're going to say it's the effects from an alcohol abuse treatment program. My voice just got very high there because I don't know specifically. 
Uh, we've got 172 effect sizes from 39 primary studies. So I said 40 studies was what you was a large one, and I was so close to that. So we're going to assume 39 is big enough. Uh, we have four moderators in this data set, and you can uh, download it uh, if you go to Emily's website. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Uh, so you've got the traditional structure of uh, the effect size column and the study column, and then of course we've got the effect size, and each effect size has its own variance. And then these are the uh, moderators, like you typically see. So before I turn some of you off, uh, since this is probably the, the, a little bit more advanced club here, some of you probably use R quite a bit, but I'll give you my brief word on R. Uh, a few years ago when, we were, when I was in grad school, we did a little seminar on R, and after the seminar I said, well, that's nice, and I just stopped using it altogether. It was, it's very complex if, you, if anybody's ever tried to, to do these things, uh, but not so anymore. There's been a number of, of great advances, um, R Studio being the one that has completely changed my mind on using R. Um, if we have some, R, do we have any R Studio users in the group? Yep. Okay. Good. A couple. Um, if you if you've tried R and you've thought, nope, this isn't for me. I'm going to stick with with point and click or something something entirely differently. Uh, I would try out R Studio now because it really makes things quite a bit more simple. It logs it logs what you've done. It logs your plots. You know, there's not this sort of cumbersome, how do I get my data into R anymore, and where is it stored, and what's an object. You see all that right on the page. And I think I have a screenshot here. This is uh, from when I was putting this slide set together. This was what R Studio looks like. So you can type in all of your code up here. Um, over here, you see all of your package on the bottom right-hand corner, all these packages that you can just click on. There's no more library, metaphor, weird code that you have to type in. You just point and click, and, and these things are loaded. Um, the global environment shows you all of the objects, which is what R calls anything that you've basically done. Uh, they're all stored in one place. If you click on that little tab that says history, you can point and click on that. It'll automatically run what you've done in the past. And then, of course, you see the really boring console down here on the, the bottom left-hand side. So this is RStudio. Give it a shot. This is what I, this is what I use. Um, so this is just code. I'll just leave up for a second. We don't need to talk about it, but uh, Emily's uh, data set is in uh, .dta, which is a Stata format. Uh, you can actually import it into R pretty easily with, a, with the foreign package, but I won't go into that very much. So I'm going to talk about two R packages very briefly. The first one's Metaphor. Um, this was written by Wolfgang, and I'm not going to butcher his last name. We're just going to call him Wolfgang. Uh, but he's a brilliant statistician, and uh, he developed this package initially uh, for traditional meta-analysis, the, the one that we tell all of our uh, people in workshops is, is what meta-analysis is. He, he developed it for sort of one study, one effect size per study. And those things, those functions are really great. Uh, but just last um, October, or maybe even a little bit before that, he uh, created and implemented a new function within that package the rma.mv, which is the multivariate function, that allows you to calculate and uh, utilize multi-level meta-analysis. Um, and he's been actively working on this, pa on this function. Um, in fact, uh, Sandra and I have met with him a couple of times over Skype, um, and he's been working on improving how quick it is because our analyses are very large. I, have, I routinely have a couple thousand effect sizes and a couple hundred studies in my and my meta analyses when I work with Sandra and Mark on them, and it takes a really it used to take a really long time, and he's really improved it. Um, so it's a really great package, and he's got some great tutorials on it. Oh, I, this doesn't work. Um, and what I wanted to show you here, though, is the code itself. And uh, I sort of did this anticlimactically because this is the only code. There's, there's very little code that goes into these things. That's the beauty of R. If you think I'm code aversive, you could probably get behind doing these things because this is how little it is. So if you want to come back to this on the video, this is it right here. The, you just type in, I'm going to use metaphor, and uh, we can look at the data set one more time, and I want to get to this. Um, this. This line right here is it for the code. You tell it you're going to uh, run a function, rma.mv, and you tell it what the, where the effect size is located, what the variance is, where the data is, and then you specify the random effects. In this case, you're telling it uh, what the column is for the effect sizes and what the column is for the studies. 
And that is literally it. If you wanted to do one analysis very quick without moderators at all, that's all you type in there. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty simp simple process. You run that, you hit summary, uh, uh, the name of the, the, the line there, and boom, it spits out um, this multivariate meta-analysis model. Uh, so very quickly, you're gonna see these results uh, three more times. Uh, but on this, you, uh, this is, this is, I didn't manipulate this at all except to put the circles in here. Um, it gives you the estimate of the overall effect. And it also gives you the tau square results. And you can't see my little line there, but there's a little pointy thing there. Um, the, it, it tells you exactly what's level two and what's level three. So this is the tau squared associated with uh, the effect size level. And this is the tau squared associated with the study, with the study level. Um, this is, again, sort of a convenience thing for all of you if you want to come back to it. Metaphor doesn't automatically calculate I squared for you um, or R squared for you. So I won't go, th this is sort of the clunky part of, of R, which you sort of have to manipulate yourself. But this is some code if you want to calculate the I squared for the, uh, the second level and the I squared for the third level. And you can see that the I squareds are actually uh, fairly, fairly low. Same thing with the R squared. Um, now, to, to use the R squared, you have to actually tell it some moderators. Um, and the moderator statement is not mu that much uh, more complex than R. You just say mods equal, and then um, this is uh, whether or not they were in college, whether or not it was a college sample. Yeah, whether or not this was a college student. So there's two levels to this factor. There's you're either a college student or you're not. Um, and if you type in a uh, summary for this, for this model, you can get uh, the moderator analysis as well. Uh, and, and then those are the convenience functions for, for R squared as well. And this is what that looks like down here. This is, so this would be the, the moderator analysis right here. And those are the R squareds associated with, with it. Um, so it's, it's, it's quite flexible, like I, like I said. So that's it. That's, that's, that's one down. We've got two more to go. Uh, and I'll go very quickly. Um, so I use in practice, this is probably the package that I use the most when I'm conducting a multi-level meta-analysis. Um, it's quite flexible. Um, I like the way the code's set up. You can actually conduct four-level meta-analyses, which is something that I've been working on lately, um, and Sandra has been working on as well. Um, it's a little bit slow for larger data sets, but there's actually some more functions that improve that. Um, and, the, and the plots and everything uh, are, really, are really nice as well in the original package. Uh, the other R package that I'll talk about a little bit is Meta SEM. This was written by Mike Chung. Um, and this, the, I'm not going to show you the model, but this actually, underneath it, it uses a structural equation model, structural equation modeling to estimate those tau squares. So the model itself, if we write it out, is slightly different. And the way that it estimates the tau squares are slightly different, and the, and the point estimate as well. Um, and you'll see that the numbers come out a little bit different. In my comparison over the last year, I've used both these packages now for about a year, um, they, they always look very similar. There's a, I, I haven't come, run across an occasion where uh, the numbers look different enough where I would need to do something. But uh, if you like using this package, then, or if, you, if you're interested in doing structural equation modeling with meta-analysis, which is something we should talk about probably at some point here, um, you should use this. Uh, the, this is just a note on installing it uh, because the, if you go to the help sites for this package, easily the most viewed help is, and Kasha shaking her head because I've helped her do this a couple times, uh, or one time. Um, it's, it's a little bit cumbersome. You have to use R 2.15.3, and you have to use a 32-bit R version and you have to download the package straight from his website, and it's not because it's not on the CRAN. Um, so there's a couple other cumbersome things that you have, to, and you actually end up having to switch back and forth between versions. Um, that's not to say I don't like it. Um, it's just <laughs> it's just a little bit more hard to get going. Um, so that's the caveat on that. So again, uh, I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, again, one line of code. So if you're, if you're R aversive, there's, again, this is only one line of code. You've got the effect size, the variance, the data. This time, instead of specifying the random effects, you're just telling it what's the third level. You just say cluster equals, and then you type in summary, and you get something that looks like this. 
and you can see that the point estimate is about the same and I'll actually have a table where we compare everything and the tau's are somewhat similar. The third level tau I believe was 0.091 something, so this is a little bit different here. Um, uh, the nice thing about MetaSEM is it calculates the, R, uh, the I squareds for you automatically. Um, oh yeah, I wanna go back to that. And actually, um, because this, underneath this, this uses a package called OpenMX, and OpenMX gives you a little status bar. So if, it, if the program ran and everything worked the way it should, it gives you a, a zero or a one. If you get some other number there at the bottom, then you've done something horribly wrong, and you should think about your choices in life, and then go back and, and, then go back and do a different analysis. Ingrid told me when I was, when I was asking him, Ingrid Olkin, uh, I, I had a boat ride with him uh, a while ago at SRSM, and I was asking him about teaching meta-analysis. And if you've ever met him, he's, he's the sweetest man you'll ever meet, and he's very engaging. And he said that if you're going to teach statistics and meta-analysis, you gotta throw in a few jokes. Hit him with some jokes. So maybe for the last 10 minutes, I'm just gonna do a little stand-up routine. So, but you can all, you can use that and pretend you talk to him too. Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm going off course here. We're talking about R. Uh, so we can also run moderator analyses uh, with MetaSEM, and the nice thing about MetaSEM is it gives you the R squareds right away for each level. Uh, you can also do this in SAS, and I'm gonna go through this very briefly. Uh, Terry used SAS. The code is, is identical in SAS to IPD. Um, you just have to fix the variance components. You have to tell it what the variance components are. The one thing I wanna mention um, is that uh, I, I was getting tired of, if you, if, you, if you remember Terry's code, there was a bunch of parentheses. Oh, you didn't show the code, okay. So in the code for SAS, you have to actually put a bunch of parentheses with the fixed effects variance components. Uh, you don't need to do that anymore in SAS. You can, just, you can just have a weight column and say weight equals W, and that makes your life a little bit easier. And then, of course, the, this is the output, which I'll click through here quickly. Um, so just uh, quickly, here's a comparison. Um, uh, as you can see, the uh, R in SAS uses the same uh, model um, in terms of um, estimating the point estimates and the tau squares, so they get uh, identical numbers. MetaSEM, of course, uses a little bit different, so you can see some very slight variations, uh, 2501 and 2496. I think we're gonna be okay with those, those deviations from each other. Uh, <laughs> Bonus analysis. <laughs> I did this uh, using uh, Beth's, uh, Elizabeth Tipton's RoboMeta R package. That's the robust variance estimation package that was just released a few months ago. Um, and same data set, same data, uh, simple code. If you wanna go ahead and do that. Uh, and here's the comparison. Did you show any comparisons in yours? Uh, with multi-level meta-analysis? Okay, so this is the the very first comparison. Um, so the point estimate, 0.232, um, and it still, it still matches up pretty closely. I think we're gonna be okay with, with a slight deviation uh, in the second decimal. The one thing I will mention here uh, is just the one um, tau squared. Uh, actually, if you add, do I have a, nope. Uh, if you add, don't look at that slide yet, that's the fun one. Uh, if you add these taus up, you'll actually get 0.154. Um, and so this is giving you the, the robu, uh, robust variance estimation gives you the overall heterogeneity and multi-level meta-analysis in the way that it's constructed actually decomposes those random effects for you. Okay, uh, a nice little uh, graphic here, some visual uh, demonstration of this just compares all of the packages, what they can do, um, some of the things you'd want. Again, this is here not this isn't terribly interesting right now, but uh, in the future, if you'd like to think about what packages you should use, um, uh, the smiley face says, yes, it can do this. So uh, the smiley face for the first row estimate three levels. Um, all of them can do three levels. I also added HLM over here, all, even though I didn't present the code, um, but you can do all this stuff in HLM. You, you've been able to do this in HLM for the last 12 years or probably even more than that. In, in batch function, I just don't use it. Uh, the lightning bolt uh, means no, you cannot do that in this package. So you can estimate four levels in Metaphor, uh, but it's, you can only actually estimate three levels in Meta SE. 
not SEM. Yep, and we just lost that, which I guess is a good way of, uh, let's see, do I have anything else that I? Yeah. It was, very, it was getting very tired of my jokes. I have, I have literally one more slide that I, I don't even need this for. So um, are there any questions on the uh, R or SAS? OK, so um, I'll do this without a slide. This is the best way to end a presentation anyway. So uh, conclusions. Uh, Meta-analysis is messy and complex, and I think we need new ways, and we have some new ways of estimating and using that complexity. Um, and multi-level meta-analysis is one way to do that. Um, and if you know, you know multi-level meta-analysis and primary analysis, you can do multi-level meta-analysis. Um, and it's been difficult to implement until the last year when some really brilliant people have put this into, into practice. Um, one small caveat, we don't, Campbell doesn't have a specific policy on how to do multi-level meta-analysis. We might come up with one at some point. Uh, but until we come up with a specific white paper, you should probably email myself or, or, or our editors, Terry and Emily, uh, in the back there, uh, or Ariel or, or Ian, and say, you know, I want to use this. Uh, what are the things that I should mention in my protocol? How, what are the best ways to do this in my review? Um, because you probably will need a little bit of guidance. Um, and I think that's it. Uh, you can go ahead and email me if you'd like. Um, but uh, that's all I've got for you today. Thanks. Thanks.